online after this. So I'm starting that recording now, um, just so everybody is aware. So it looks like we have some familiarity with the plans, but also some new newcomers as well. So the, the first West Edge plan, again, was drafted in 2014. And it really noted that the, the historical character of the neighborhood and kind of hearkening back to the industrial heritage. Um, they, they noted that it was an industrial area, but the, the blocks, the, the streets, all of that sort of thing was very complementary to downtown and development in the area could be kind of a development that would complement downtown uh, with more mix of uses, um, maybe cafes, bars, breweries, that sort of thing, while also kind of hearkening back to the, the, um, the industrial nature of the area. So again, yeah, they noted that it is currently zone light industrial. And while these uses are what made the area unique, they, there was the, the planning effort at the time foresaw more uses coming into the area that may not necessarily fit into that industrial character. This vision was further refined in the 2016 West Edge area-wide plan. So this plan really laid out the format that uh, I would say the planning and development department is looking at now, in which we're looking at using, using an overlay district to um, rezone most of the area to mixed use, but also have an overlay district that allows various different buildings and uh, permissions for maybe parking reductions uh, due to some constraints on for on-site parking and that sort of thing. It also mentions the need for some design regulations. And with that, um, a lot of the industrial redevelopment sites that we're seeing um, in, in different places uh, kind of have that, that edge towards it, you know, and um, have that, that industrial feel and, and chat. So I do have a question here um, with what is the Minty code? And I will go ahead and throw that in the chat here. Sorry for those of you that did not get that code. One second here. And I'll just leave it in here as well. And going from that, um, it, it kind of talks about the design regulations kind of being more inspirational and something that developers should should look to and but not necessarily be prescriptive, kind of more suggestions. And that kind of tied into some of the outreach that we had done last year. Uh, the, the planning and development department started looking to do more outreach on updating these zoning regulations in March of 2020. And I, I believe we all remember what happened in March of 2020. Um, that was sort of when we all went on quarantine break. So we did our outreach online and this was when we um, got some feedback from some more stakeholders in the area. Um, and what we found with this outreach is that it a lot of what had been put in the 2014 and 2016 plans still resonated. Um, people felt that the, the mix of uses um, would be critical for the area. And then that design regulations and building materials would be important given the fact that there are a lot of existing buildings um, that aren't going to live up to the, the current building regulations. Uh, furthermore, um, we, we also heard from some people that it would be nice to have the entire area rezoned consistent with the plan. Um, this, this was a specific person who had gone through the rezoning process with the city, and they just noted that um, it, it was an, an easy process to go through, but it was time consuming for individual applicants. So going on from this, what do you feel are the most important items for West Edge zoning regulations to address to foster redevelopment? Hello all, this is Charles Bloom, Planning and Development Director. While you're taking some time to 
to answer those questions on menti.com. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the previous processes for some types of development in the West Edge area. Uh, majority of it, as Mr. Christensen had said, is zoned industrial. So if one had a house or wished to rehab or develop a residential area, typically they had to go through a uh, a rezoning, which that process can take upward, upwards of three to four months because it involves review by the planning commission. And it um, also involves review by the governing body in the form of three readings um, and uh, several committee meetings. So those are some of the issues that we saw that were hindering development um, in the past in that area. And I apologize, I just realized I had sent the code to all the panelists. So the three of us, um, I sent the code now to all panelists and attendees. So apologies on that one, but uh, looks like we're figuring out how to use Menti as we go. So um, at, yeah, so it seems like a lot of people are discussing uh, the need for a mix of uses, uh, collaboration, less red tape, parking, and flexibility. Um, just curious if anybody um, would like to raise their hand to elaborate a little bit on the, the different um, or what they may have put into the chat. And Sam will be looking for those hands and I, I believe she may have the uh, ability to unmute you, but if not, I can go ahead and do so. Great, we have Dr. Aldrich, and you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, thank you so much. Um, I actually have been thinking about this quite a bit, and I'm really hopeful that the West Edge will really kind of anchor um, our downtown area, meaning um, that it would, you know, be the, and I really think the West Edge is probably the walking limit if you start at the depot that, you know, most people are willing to walk. Um, one way to, you know, access entertainment or restaurants or um, that type of thing. So I really, I, I guess one of my questions is how does this work in with the Reed Corridor um, or, you know, is that incorporated into this? And then secondly, um, how do we make sure that we are not, um, that we're making it flexible enough and multi-use enough to attract not only businesses, but um, you know maybe some loft apartments, things like that, that um, could help to anchor that and for lack of a better term, uh, gentrify that area. D Dr. Aldrich, thank you for your questions. And those are all great questions. Um, I totally agree that this could be a, a focal point to complement what's going on downtown. There's there's a lot of work being done in, in the downtown right now by the DDA and it's really showing and we, we really think this West Edge project could complement what's going on there. And uh, in regards to the Reed Rail project, um, that, that project is under the, the engineering wing of the city government. So it's in the city engineer's office. So, but what we're doing here in planning is to really complement that effort. Um, the, the zoning regulations will be the, the component that addresses what happens on private land. So if you think of the, the public improvements that the city's doing and, but the zoning regulations will help dictate uh, how the, the private sector responds to that and what the private sector can build. In regard to the mix of uses, I couldn't agree more that the, the more residential in the area will be needed. Um, one of the things we commonly hear is that that notion of rooftops before retail. So really to kind of have those great places, those great walkable places um, in which you have cafes on the corner and places to go in the evening, um, you really do need those rooftops in the area. And part of that is being in close proximity to one another. So with that and with the regulations, um, what we're looking at is a combination of the mixed use residential and also the mixed use business. And both of those districts um, allow for building types like the urban loft and multi-dwelling uh, units as well. So hopefully bringing all this together um, 
propels the the development community to to look into building more housing in the area as well. And and I would like to add that Mark did a wonderful job of summarizing that um, with how the zoning, the overlay district relates to the overall West Edge pl plan and is a little bit different than the brick and mortar plan for the public realm for the Reed Rail Corridor. Um, so he did a wonderful job there. The um, one thing I noticed on this slide here and this is based on responses, is the more responses you get of the same, the larger the letters are. We have a large item saying parking as a large uh, concern and also less red tape. As we go along further in this slide, we do have a discussion point specifically surrounding parking. So we can see if this is something that you all view as a concern, view as a need, or you view that it might not need to be in place. So we'll move forward to that as well. But overall in the planning and development department over the last um, two and a half years, we've been really focused on trying to remove that red tape and trying to utilize any of these infill development opportunities that we can utilize on a property. Um, and part of the goal of this overlay is to incentivize development and try to get people to incorporate this overlay and utilize this overlay so they can um, develop the property and remove any obstacles towards development. Thank you, Charles, for elaborating on that. So um, we'll go ahead and move on here. So to, to address the, the West Edge zoning, what we, we have come up with so far is what we're calling the urban use overlay. So the urban use overlay is a district that is applicable to various lands adjacent to the central business district. Uh, what we were looking at when we were creating these zoning regulations was the possibility to, if, if this proves to be successful and flexible and an answer that the development community uh, likes and wants to utilize, uh, we wanted it to be applicable to more places than just the West Edge. So we, we said it would be various lands adjacent to the central business district and that a base zone district of CBD, which is the central business district on this map, it's shown in pink, the, the darker pink, MUB, which is mixed use business. Uh, we have spots of it here in the West Edge and up here along 24th Street. And then NUR, excuse me, which is mixed use residential. So in getting into what these actual regulations look like, so uh, more specific to the West Edge, um, when we think of design guidelines for this, the the urban use overlay will be required to meet the design guidelines of UDC 6.7. And what that means in general is that this is kind of our mixed use design guidelines. It has things such as material standards, standards for entrances to buildings, um, standards for um, the windows that you may have on a storefront, uh, really things that try to create an active use and try to make buildings appealing from the sidewalk. Um, that would be in general what the, the urban use overlay design guidelines would look like. But with the special provisions of the West Edge, we would, we'd like to note that properties that are included in the UU overlay district that are within the West Edge should incorporate the design guidelines from chapter five of the 2016 West Edge area wide plan. And what that means is it, it kind of harkens back to that 2016 plan where it said that these design guidelines should be more of a inspiration for developers. And some of the outreach we did last year kind of yielded that, um, that notion in which people um, felt like a lot of the development that is happening in the West Edge is really following the, the intent of the plans, um, the materials being used, uh, the, the style of development, um, places such as the Lotus townhomes and Warehouse 21 and um, the West Edge Collective. They were all kind of already incorporating that type of feel into the West Edge. And then um, we also want to encourage adaptive reuse. Uh, adaptive reuse is really when um, developers incorporate an existing building into their, their design process. So um, any of those adaptive reuse projects um, would be able to receive, 
receive an exemption from the UDC 6.7 um, design standards if they incorporate a significant building from the significant building plan in uh, 20, the 2016 West Edge plan. So Mark, getting into like the- a, It looks like there's a question in the chat if you wanna address that. Yep, just getting into the next section. So when we're looking at the UU set area, um, the, the following lot and building standard shall apply and replace the lot standings for the underlying districts. So the MUB, CBD, and MUR, these regulations right here would replace what those underlying regulations are, um, except for the detached dwelling, semi-attached dwelling, and attached dwelling, um, which would be permitted to have reduced setbacks of five feet minimum um, from the front. So the reason that we went with 1.7 acres maximum is that is actually the size of an original city block. Um, when we were looking at this, um, we, we would like to encourage projects that uh, don't you know, try to vacate any right, rights of way and create super blocks. Um, and that we, the, the way the blocks are laid out in the area is very urban and promotes walkability as it is. So we wouldn't really like any vacation of rights away, even though that would have to go through a city process in itself, uh, we'd like to encourage that 1.7 acres maximum. So uh, when we get the setbacks, um, zero feet is the minimum with a 10 foot maximum. And what this 10 foot maximum does is makes people build their buildings to the street. And that just creates an active front for the pedestrian realm. Uh, the maximum building height is 65 feet. The reason that we went with this regulation is that's actually the, the height of the Cheyenne elevator, which is a pretty noteworthy building on in the West Edge. And then as far as maximum coverage goes, um, it would be 90%, but 100% if the site were to provide a street furnishing or projection as listed in this section, which we'll get to here in a second. Just quickly here. Um, here's the significant building list. As you can see, um, there's the, the Cheyenne Elevator, the Granary and Bakery, the old Visitor Center building, um, the Steam Plant, and Pump House. So there, there are some significant buildings listed here. I, I believe this is something that the Planning and Development Department would be willing to reassess as we actually bring these, these regulations to fruition. So the, the second focus area, uh, component of the focus area for urban design is a pedestrian zone. So with the West Edge, we'd really like to encourage people to utilize cafe zones, um, utilize street furnishings, uh, public art, things like that, that really um, allow the pedestrians to interact with the place that they're at. So we would permit street furnishings and projections into the right of way, so long as it does not interfere with the five foot required ADA pedestrian path. And if a development is to incorporate some of these street furnishing and projections, um, they must be incorporated in their site plan. So these furnishings can include, as I had mentioned, benches, tables, chairs, decorative patio fencing, hosting stands, and other items. And then other projections, maybe awnings, patios, and there's, there's a lot of options for this. And with that, we wanted to ask you guys, what do you feel are important components in creating an active street front? And again, if as the answers trickle in, Minty always kind of take a, a second to refresh. If anybody would like to raise their hand and talk about what makes an active street front for them, what makes them uh, really fall in love with the place. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, yes, Charles Bloom, Planning and Development Director again. And feel free to kind of incorporate elements that you might see on the area surrounding the West Edge that you might think may be appropriate to transition into this area. Thank you for that, Charles. And I want to add here, um, when we when we are thinking about these West Edge overlay, it will be a specific part of the code that will apply to this area. But um, a lot of our other standards, such as landscaping and lighting, will be incorporated into these regulations as they're already provisions in the UDC. So uh, items such as street trees and uh, a lighting plan would be required as well. 
and and this is Charles again. I would like to just I'm seeing landscaping being a common theme that people are are bringing up here. What elements of landscaping are you if anyone would care to speak about this? What elements are specifically of interest? Is it street trees? Is it grass spaces? Is it natural areas? On-site landscaping, parking lot landscaping? What type of elements? If, if anyone would like to raise their hand and expand on that, that would be valuable for us. And I do see uh, Mark Madsen with a hand raise and I have given you permission to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, and thanks for taking this. Uh, you know, what I think about this, especially Charles, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but if, if I think of my favorite landscapes in Wyoming, there's components of cowfish and lander. And, you know, so essentially you've got the trees with uh, the tree skirts that are in the right of way. And I know that that could be maybe a, a, a little more complicated as you try to keep that five foot path open. But mm -hmm. now you've got some bit of, um, you've got shade and you've got some bit of, um, of, of wind break. And I think it ties the whole thing together. So I'm, I'm, the, the components of landscape are really difficult on a streetscape as we know. And this was part of the infill requirements, you know, when, when, when we lowered the, for infill and that, that it was hard, but on that street side, I think, you know, Cheyenne's done a fairly good job with the tree skirts, the trees and the tree skirts. So that fairly simply is the way I view, you know, properly landscape buildings. Perfect, thank you for that commentary. That's great, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Aldrich, you still do have the ability to unmute your hand. I'm just gonna go ahead real fast and read some of the, the chat that we're getting here. Um, we do have that uh, Richard J has said that shopping, events, shade, music, bike racks, and trash cans make him happy. So that's stuff that we'll definitely look to incorporate. Um, maybe there's some special provisions in our, our code update for um, temporary events and stuff like that. And then Eric had mentioned, uh, will the ability to build wind blocks be allowed in the right of way? I think some of these items such as landscaping can definitely be incorporated to serve as natural wind blocks. Um, but we're still in the planning and development department hoping to get that giant bubble over Cheyenne to address that issue at some point. This is um, Michelle. And I just wanted to make a note. When I think about landscaping, and I think that um, I think a lot about Sintera, for instance, where they've used the hanging flower pots that are seasonal. Um, but I think that whatever we do needs to be easily maintained and we need to think about a long term cost of maintaining it. Um, I know they've used a lot of natural grasses, the um, taller grasses that can be used for filling in areas. Um, and I just think that maybe I would hope that we would take into consideration um, how water intensive the plantings might be as well as um, what long term maintenance and upkeep is going to look like for those. So thank you. Dr. Aldrich, thank you for that comment. Um, that's definitely something that we are considered of in the planning and development department. Oftentimes the landscaping is, does fall to the um, duty of the property owner to maintain. Uh, but we, we have been looking at our landscaping code and looking for more water wise um, plantings that, that, would, that we could incorporate into our code and encourage um, the development community to utilize those plantings. I do have another raised hand here, one second. I'll get the participants. Um, and I believe it's Councilman White. Uh, you do have the ability to unmute yourself. This I presentation, I think perhaps um, a collaboration with uh, the organization uh, rooted in Cheyenne might be uh, might be a, a good option. Um, I do think there's definitely more trees needed uh, in the West Edge uh, if if uh, if if it can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think rooted in Cheyenne could uh, possibly solve that issue. 
Thank you, Councilman White. Um, yeah, definitely appreciate that. We do have some um, connections with Rooted and Cheyenne through Mark Ellis and our city forester. And uh, Richard J also uh, suggested xeriscaping. Um, there's some great examples of communities in the region that have looked at doing um, xeriscaping. So I think looking at all those options, the Rooted in Cheyenne, uh, Master Gardeners, and uh, maybe just looking at more water-wise code would help. So it, it appears from the um, discussion that we've had, a lot of folks are really emphasizing the need to focus on the public realm and areas that are beneficial to the site and how it interacts with creating shade spaces and wind blocks, um, those types of landscaping treatments. So that is something we can continue to keep in mind as we develop landscaping that would be appropriate for the West Edge and this urban interface. Thank you for that, Charles. And we, we do have a, another uh, comment in the chat. I'll just pull that up real fast here. Um, we, this comes from, it looks like Barb said, think about maintaining, improving stormwater quality by infiltrating rain snow melt where possible, such as planters designed to catch and infiltrate runoff, as well as provide water to plantings rather than run water directly to storm drains. Uh, nicely landscaped shady areas to sit and people watch would be really nice. And that that's a great point as well. I, I believe there's opportunities to incorporate um, green infrastructure and um, maybe there are incentives that we can utilize in the zoning code to encourage green infrastructure. So thank you for the discussion on this um, with the, the West Edge and uh, the important components in creating an active street front. So the next regulation that we're looking at doing is relating to parking. And parking is always a big discussion. Um, there is oftentimes in the West Edge, a lot of the lots are pretty small and meeting parking regulations on a site by site basis can be difficult. So in looking at parking, um, we're looking at reducing the minimum required automobile parking from UDC to 6.2.4 a which is just the parking table and reducing these up to 50 percent um, additionally buildings that fall within the west edge district generally located from 24th to union pacific and from Cary to missile drive shall receive an exemption from the parking standards if the building incorporates an existing uh, if the development incorporates an existing building um, in addition to this, we'd like to see a lot more active transportation in the West Edge. So kind of looking to provide more bicycle parking and then allow this bike bicycle parking to maybe be grouped by developments. So maybe multiple developments are able to pay into a cash and loo fund in which bicycle parking is paid for out of this cash and loo fund. And we, we also felt this would be a good opportunity for the potential to brand um, maybe bicycle racks as communities um, in places like Laramie do. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the chat real fast. Um, oh, and this I believe was from the last option is, are we looking for better financing options for loft living as is nearly impossible? And we, we have noted that that is an issue. Um, and as, as far as zoning goes, it, it is difficult to address via zoning, but it's definitely a consideration we have. But and, go ahead, and Mark, I would like to add that um, we already do have a an amount of flexibility for infill and redevelopment where we can grant a 50% reduction by code already. So we talk about a 50% reduction what's required. We still have the ability to go a little bit lower. So for example, if you have an existing building or an existing or an existing site that you wish to develop, um, right off the cuff, what we would do is say, you know what, we're going to take 50% of that requirement off. Then administratively, we can evaluate on a case by case basis based on what's occurring in that block in that area we can look at granting up to 50% more additional relief. So that is how the parking would work on those newer constructions that would occur in this West Edge overlay. That's our idea. And another thing that we have talked about, um, just Charles's conversation kind of sparked my uh, memory of what we've talked about in the city side of things is there, there might be opportunities in the West Edge for um, 
city maintained parking lots, if there is the need for additional parking um, as individual sites may um, vary on if they're able to meet the parking minimum. So I'll go ahead and put up the next question here. Uh, what do we feel parking requirements should look like in the West Edge? Again, um, as presented, a 50% reduction and exemption for using existing buildings, no parking requirements except for residential uses, no reduction in parking from current standards, or other, is there something that the planning and development department should consider? And Mark, while people are answering, I think there's a few more comments in the chat if you want to address those. Definitely. Thank you, Sam. So Eric said, um, allow businesses to purchase the racks and put their name on it, um, like New Belgium did in Fort Collins. Even if one business doesn't come to the table for all of them, they can be an individual purchased. And that would actually be really cool um, to kind of give those, those individual businesses ownership over their bike rack. And it also encourage maybe their employees to bike to work. Um, Mr. Wiggum, I do see that you have a comment that says none to all panelists. Would you care to elaborate that? I can unmute you or you can kind of add more information into the chat. And Councilman White, I do see your hand is up. Is this from the, the last time we called on you or do you have something to add? There we go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. I, I, I didn't lower it. Sorry. No worries. That is all right. And I do believe, um, Mr. Wiggum, if you would like me to address that, you're inferring that you mean no parking requirements. I mean, exactly. secondly, yes, correct. And that's that's what I had assumed there. And there's another comment that is is frequent. Um, Councillor Johnson had made that we don't have a parking problem. We have a a perception problem with folks that believe that they need parking immediately adjacent to the destination they are going. Um, so that is a, another point regarding public education as to educate folks that they can get there if they don't need a park right next door. And a lot of places um, we do see in a lot of downtowns, a lot of places do eliminate parking requirements. Um, the city of Cheyenne does not have parking requirements in the central business district, except for residential uses. Um, and a lot of the, the theory behind this is that the, the market will decide how much parking you need. In a lot of places, um, they're actually looking at more parking maximums rather than parking minimums. So I, I do believe um, a lot of cities have felt there there is a perception that there might be a parking issue um, when really if you look at the supply and when it's utilized um, a lot of places end up being over parked looks like um, a lot of uh, the attendees have felt that as presented 50 percent reduction and exemption for using existing buildings is a good route to go um, but the planning and development department is still assessing these regulations and it may look a little different when we bring it forward And next question. So how can the West Edge Overly District encourage active transportation, such as biking? Um, a, a lot of communities have really built up their bike infrastructure, encourage biking to work, um, really have nice bicycle facilities. So what are ways that we, the maybe zoning, um, besides requiring biking parking and that sort of thing, encourage active transportation? And again, for those who haven't quite figured out to use Minty, um, if you do have a laptop or smartphone, uh, you can go to www.menti, that is M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then the code to participate is I do see a raised hand here, and I will go ahead and call on Councilman Laybourne. You do have the ability to unmute yourself at this time. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Well, obviously this is uh, super important as far as that critical junction of the Greenway to downtown from the uh, 
pump house wetland park area and the new area that's going to be constructed here for the new piece of path from Martin Luther King Park to the Ames Avenue underpass, as well as an issue that um, really needs to be raised, which is the crossing of Lincoln Way from those from that Greenway Junction mm -hmm. and how it would access the corridor. So that is very much uh, up in the air. I certainly enjoy the conversation thus far about uh, this issue. I have been interested in many years in seeing a rezoning that makes redevelopment uh, better throughout that district. So um, I expect that uh, I'll certainly be bringing forward some maps and some consideration here because I don't think it's well understood how important that connection is and how difficult it is. So over the years, we've had some uh, real challenges with having a safe and connected greenway system uh, that have really uh, uh, advocates have overcome a lot of problems, but I think we really need to understand that without a good connection across Lincoln Way at the corridor, um, that's not going to happen. So if you're, if you're going by the, the West Edge Collective there by the newspaper, mm -hmm. uh, please think about how we are to cross that and get up into the corridor because uh, the current design is utterly inadequate along Snyder and then up a pretty pretty steep grade up to uh, the corridor on 17th Street. So uh, that definitely needs some attention. I wouldn't say that it is a, exactly a zoning issue as we're discussing here, but if you're talking about connectivity and the importance of it, it, it is really important. So uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Layborn. And I was going to add, um, Councilman Layborn, that's an excellent point you do bring up about the connectivity of this area to the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, one of the tools we could use through zoning, and this is just to plant a small seed, not necessarily say it is a seed that we're going to uh, grow, but is there could be some type of district impact fee or a district fee that would uh, support some type of special account that could be utilized for those connections. So that could be something that could be tailored through zoning um, at, at some future time as we move forward with this project. And thank you for that, Charles, and thank you, Councilman Layborn. And I, I just want to kind of go over some of these things that we're seeing. And I think one of the good points is that, um, you know, get the businesses there first, get the people there first, and then, um, but always have that consideration of getting that, having the connections available in the future, uh, whether that be sidewalks and that sort of thing. So um, having those connections to the Greenway is important. We do have Greenway nearby and um, just making sure we facilitate that connection is important. But um, what maybe the most important thing is getting the, the people and businesses to come first. I, I think that's a, it's a compelling point. So in looking at this, um, the, the area moving on to the use provisions, which is our focus area for, um, the industrial uses are kind of what gives the, the neighborhood its identity, but um, not, maybe not all these industrial uses are compatible with uh, potential residential uses and other things that may be coming into the area. So all the uses allowed in the underlying zoning district will be permitted, except for those that are specifically prohibited or allowed in the subsections below. Uh, the outright prohibited uses may be impoundment yards, outdoor sales, automobile service repair, automobile service station, and then a conditional use would be moderate industrial. Just to give everybody a basic idea of what those allowed uses in the underlying zoning districts are, so that would be central business district, mixed use business, and mixed use residential. Those would be your residential uses, your food service uses, and um, 
office uses and maybe places for community gatherings and entertainment as well. So looking at the use provisions, what uses should be permitted to fulfill the West Edge vision? Uh, we've heard in the past looking at the, the residential uses to, to kind of spur the, the commercial development. Um, what are some of those uses that you would like to see in the area? And again, if any participants would like to raise their hand, uh, talk about some of the uses that they would like to see, um, go ahead and go for it and we'll, we'll be happy to unmute you. Again, Minty does take a second to load up the answers and create the word cloud for the initial responses. All. So in addressing this, um, this, this comment says, if you're trying to get an urban vibe, um, I would allow outdoor sales to help add life to the street scene. And just to be specific, I guess, um, from the, the planning and development code, the, the unified development code that we have has specific um, definitions on which those things fall into. And actually our outdoor sales definition is more kind of large scale outdoor sales, including um, automobile sales and stuff of that nature. We do have sidewalk sales and seasonal sales that kind of gives more of that, that opportunity for small businesses to have smaller displays on the outside and that sort of thing. But great point, I definitely think that having some outdoor components to some smaller retail uh, always adds life to the street. Yes, and outdoor sales and outdoor eating areas, those are presently permitted accessory uses to the businesses that you see in that urban streetscape. So those are items that we would ensure would still be allowed to be um, utilized in the urban use overlay district. And so I, I see here, we'd like to see a grocery store and I'm all in on that too. I would definitely love to be able to walk to a grocery store after work and pick up a few things. Um, I do see um, some concerns uh, with some transient populations in the area. Um, the city did just recently draft some regulations for emergency shelter. So um, hopefully, hopefully that can help the situation. And, um, it, I think what's important to think about with the West Edge in general and in the city as a whole is the, the city is looking at some housing affordability issues and maybe it, that's something that the West Edge can look at also is how do we create attainable housing um, in the community? Are there incentives that we can provide under the zoning code to allow for attainable housing and allow people to, to get their foot in the door um, to get off the streets or what, what are some things that we can look at with zoning um, to address the larger issue that's happening with affordability in our community. This is an interesting comment here. It says Rapid City has a good variety uh, with pubs, restaurants, shops, bistros, and delis. Um, What's interesting about that is somebody in the, we gave this presentation to the DDA yesterday and they had also mentioned that Rapid City has a good example. Um, permit fees and tax fees should be reduced. That's an interesting component. That's something that um, incentivizing development, um, those are things that other communities look at to do to incentivize development. Um, looking at this this question here, it, it notes that we should be careful about excluding industrial uses. And we definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, so a lot of the, the big uses, um, uh, some of the industrial players in the area, at that time that these regulations are adopted, they would become non-conforming uses, which would mean that they would still be able to locate within the West Edge District. Um, just the fact that if they were to expand or anything of that nature, they would just need to go through a conditional use process. And that would, the conditional use process for items such as that would just mean that they need to conform, um, meet the criteria for a conditional use and conform to the, to the surrounding area.
great answers on this one. Um, looking to the next one, are there uses that should be prohibited in the West Edge? We'll go ahead and give Minty a couple seconds to refresh and. Yes, and and we've it. learned, yeah, we've learned the smaller the group, the uh, less responsive folks have been on this, um, because ultimately a lot of people don't want to discourage any specific uses. Um, but yes, this could be anything from you know heavy industrial, big box, what we see here. Um, um, then you have other uh, types of uses like common in, in downtowns and urban areas. There's a perception that people don't want to see churches because they're primarily only used on the weekend or government offices, um, you know, things like that. I do see parking lots. Um, and that's that's something that we've considered when drafting these regulations and looking at reducing parking ratios. Um, not only does do parking lots take up a lot of real estate? They also create an urban heat island effect um, as they often contain less vegetation, less landscaping, and uh, really make isolated places hotter. And one of the elements that we are looking at with any parking in the area, because it's been noted that may maybe the city could provide some type of public parking that could benefit the area, is are there specific ways we can mitigate any impacts? Could we have additional landscaping? Could we have different edge treatments that would uh, create that streetscape we're still looking for? A lot of you may be familiar with the uh, Lincoln Way and the 17th Street, the placemaking plan. So different elements like that that we could incorporate um, for parking lots that could be in the West Edge District to lessen the impacts that are commonly associated with them. And just looking at the chat, Mr. Wiggum had a comment that churches, um, places of worship in general, if done correctly, have activities all week long and are great for preschool and, or daycare. So do serve a, a place in the community. And if, if we're looking at, you know, when we're looking at the West Edge, um, we really are thinking about this future walkable community. And um, when we think of mixed use, we really want to look at places that have amenities uh, within walking distance. And that, that may include your place of worship too. So uh, definitely appreciate that comment as well. And I, and I, I do agree with Mr. Wiggum there that churches have almost become um, seven day week operations um, nowadays and they are vital parts of the communities because they offer a variety of services. Thank you for the discussion on that component here. Um, then, so just in general, I would like to just show the West Edge in general as we have it defined. Um, almost all of our planning efforts in the past have really looked at the West Edge being, the, the boundaries being somewhat vague. Um, it can expand into downtown a little bit, you know, maybe expands a little bit more down Lincoln Way. But in general, um, we're looking from 24th Street, um, to the Union Pacific Railroad and then from Cary uh, over to Missile Drive. So thinking about the West Edge regulations, um, should the re city rezone the West Edge or allow individual property owners to rezone? Uh, when we're thinking about this, um, the, the city rezoning, the, the process would look like the city coming up and drafting the urban use overlay district regulations. And then shortly after that, uh, applying a base zone of either the CBD, the MUB, or the MUR, and subsequently mapping that urban use overlay uh, to those properties that it would it would contain. Um, if we were to let individual property owners rezone, which has been the 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 case thus far, I would say, uh, those property owners would have the ability to go for the MUB, MUR, or CBD zone, and then apply the um, urban use overlay at that time. 
Um, again, I, I would like to stress that if the city were to do and initiate the rezoning, uh, those uses that are currently within the area that are industrial uh, or light industrial would if, if they weren't permitted with the new urban use overlay, they would be considered non-conforming uses. And uh, similar to this was when the city initially rezoned the area light industrial. I believe it may have been in the 80s, maybe the 90s. Um, a lot of those homes on the other side of Snyder, a lot of those single family homes became non-conforming uses at that point. So as Charles mentioned earlier, some of those single family homes have to come in for a conditional use process to even put a garage on their property. So it, it doesn't force the, the non-conforming uses to move out of the area, rather allows them to exist and only go to the the Board of Adjustment if they look to expand those uses. And we have a comment here that says, don't disrupt the CBD zoned area. The area that needs rezoned is generally west of um, Thomes, where light industrial is the current zoning. And that is a, um, we, we were thinking about how can we incorporate the urban use overlay to um, the, the CBD zone and see if there were any benefits there. And that's something that we're still assessing. Um, I do see Dr. Aldrich again has her hand raised and um, you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, just a quick question, Mr. Christensen. I'm just wondering if as, so if we were to allow individual property owners to rezone, um, when the property changes hands, at that point, would the new, um, would they, are they basically grandfathered in forever unless they add a garage or want to make some sort of a structural change? Or when they, when the property changes hands, does it revert or go forward into the new zoning? So I believe, um, Charles, you can go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so as long as the use is continual and constant, then they are still permitted to have that non-conforming status. So when a home changes hands, um, it is a non-conforming use, but since it's still being transferred over to another homeowner and being used as a place of a residence, then that's still allowed to go in uh, perpetuity essentially. Though we do have a lot of questions um, when people are doing their due diligence of having a, a home that is a non-conforming use. That is absolutely correct. So a house can change hands, a business can change hands. In fact, if you have a retail store that's operated as one retail business and it changes its name to another retail business, uh, let's say a blockbuster to a Hollywood video, those are allowed to occur. You can change signs, you can change stuff like that. Um, those are all allowed to occur for non-conforming uses. It comes to the point when you want to add on or you want to expand, that's when there are problems. There have been some documented times with residential uses that are non-conforming where a finance company may not be comfortable loaning on a property that if destroyed could not be rebuilt. So that is a problem that we can see right now in the industrial area that is developed with residential uses. Thank you for elaborating on that, Charles. So it looks like uh, we're looking, and this is the route that the Planning and Development Department has felt that uh, we would want to go is with a, a city-initiated rezone. And Dr. Aldrich, I would just like to confirm, uh, did we answer your question there? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So I wanna thank everybody again for attending this, this workshop. And um, so, with this urban use overlay zoning, what we're looking at doing is uh, we've held the planning commission work session in January. Uh, we are looking, we have been doing community and stakeholder meetings. Uh, this is our community meeting. Um, we've also met with the DDA and um, other individual property owners in the area discussing this item. Um, we are holding a city council work session next month. Um, if you would like to attend, that meeting will be March 19th at noon, in which we'll give a similar presentation to this and ask for uh, council feedback. And then looking at uh, council introduction in April of uh, 
in April, and then uh, bringing that forward to adoption in summer of 2021. Uh, as far as the rezoning process goes, if you are unaware, uh, the, the rezoning and text amendment would go to planning commission, who would make a recommendation to the city council. And then the ordinances are heard at three separate readings. Um, they're introduced, referred to public services committee, and then brought back for second reading and then again go to Public Services Committee and then head for adoption. Um, if we look at doing the route in which the city initiates rezoning, um, the, the rezoning of the actual properties would follow the, the text amendment to introduce these urban use overlay regulations. So with that, I would again like to thank you for your attendance. Um, again, my name is Mark Christensen with the Planning and Development Department. Um, I can go ahead and drop my contact information in the chat. Um, but if anybody has any last second thoughts or anything else they'd like to share, um, feel free to raise your hand or drop a comment in the chat. Um, again, thank you for using Mentimeter and um, following along with this presentation. Thank you guys for putting this on and for um, making this available to our community. Thank you for your attendance, Dr. Aldrich. Again, um, this presentation will be put together into um, a recording that we'll post online and allow other members of the public who are unable to attend to drop their comments in here as well. Uh, yes, and I'll add, um, we will be putting this on the Planning and Development Department webpage. Um, the easiest way to get there is the city website, www.cheyennecity.org backslash planning and development. Uh, we should have this up in the next couple of days, and this is not our last of public outreach. We'll be having uh, the work session with council, um, and there will probably be some additional outreach opportunities for discussion. Um, so again, we encourage feedback. Feel free to rewatch this video. If any additional comments or questions come up, feel free to shoot Mark um, or any member of our department an email, and we can go ahead and, and address those for you. Again, thank you very much. I am going to go ahead and end the meeting. Um, feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions that you may have and uh, have a great evening. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Charles.